Your Partner in Success Radio is a free business podcast with host Denise Griffiths. It's all about great stories, conversation, and context to help you move your business and life forward with actionable tips and advice from her guest experts. To listen and subscribe, just find us on iTunes, Google Play, or wherever you consume your podcasts. Welcome to your Partner in Success Radio, where top performers share their secrets to help you achieve your personal and professional goals. I'm your host, Denise Griffiths, and together with my incredible guests, we will bring you inspiring and actionable insights and tips to take your life and your business to the next level. This podcast is ranked in the top 2% of the most popular podcasts globally. So really, it's a must listen if I do say so myself. So let's dive in. And today we are talking about unlocking your potential, embracing power and prospect, prosperity with my guest, Jessica Weaver. Jess is a wealth advisor. She's a three-time best-selling author and owner-founder of the Women's Wealth Boutique, which happens to be the fastest-growing woman-owned financial firm in the United States. That's impressive. The Women's Wealth Boutique was founded in 2022. It's not the old, y'all. I'm going to ask her about that because she has just gone from, okay, I'm going to do this to stratosphere and nothing flat and it was founded in 2022 to create a supportive environment for women financial advisors and women investors and her company is a registered investment advisory firm with women financial advisors in states across the united states i'm losing my voice i'm so sorry jessica it's spring y'all you it's pink and yellow and every color but green out there if there's any pollen it has found me So Jessica was named in the top 10 female disruptors of 2022 after disrupting the financial industry with her new firm, hashtag pink fix movement. And her company operates as a multimedia enterprise offering books, podcasts, magazines, and remarkable events. I'm going to ask her about one that she just had. Through these platforms, she empowers individuals to take charge of their financial futures. Jessica, welcome to your Partner in Success Radio. I'm thrilled to have you here today, and yours is a really fascinating story. Thank you so much for having me, Denise. I am thrilled to be here and to spend some time with you today. Well, as as I mentioned, thank you. As I mentioned in the green room, you're going to be doing all the talking. Every time I open my (laughs) mouth, this croaking sound comes out, and it's embarrassing, so I say bad words, and then I stop talking. <laughs> so here we go. But in, again, in the green room, you said something. You were telling me about an event. I follow you on Facebook and LinkedIn, and you had a heck of an event last week, so share that with us. We did, Denise. We had this event, and we actually have a national holiday, National Pink Fix Day, so we celebrate our I wouldn't call it a company. It's our movement. It's kind of this alliance of women supporting women when it comes to our money, our businesses, our careers, even our relationships, all different forms of wealth. So every year on May 17th, we celebrate. And this year, we had we celebrated with a bang, I'll say, Denise. We had ladies flying into, I'm located in New Jersey, and we had women flying in from Alabama, Michigan, Washington State, Texas, all over the United States to be united on this front. It was our Hidden Power of Change, a financial summit for women. So we had speakers who were financial experts, financial advisors, coaches, uh, different partnerships that we've created over the last year especially. And it was amazing to see in the audience we had women business owners, our partners, clients, advisors, and our whole goal is for us to create wealth together. Whenever I work with a client, when I work with an advisor, anyone, it's for us to create wealth together. And that's that's what happened in the room. It was amazing to see in such a large event. We had over 60 women. Everyone kept saying how intimate it felt. And you don't hear that a lot when it comes to conferences or seminars about money. But all of our speakers, we we really did. We brought our vulnerable stories forth. We let everyone know that, yes, we, we're going to have setbacks. We're going to have issues with our money. We're going to, what at the time might feel like a failure, 
but it really is just constantly setting us up for that next step. And it was just the energy in the room. We're still getting emails. We're still bombarded with emails, text messages about the event and how more women can get involved. And that's what it's all about. And that's a wonderful story because you're right. Listen, my sister is brilliant at finances. Me, not so much. She lives, breathes, eats it. I'm like, oh, God, I've got to pay the water bill today. <laughs> you know, it's just, you know, some people just don't understand our money. We don't understand how to operate with it. And I'll be honest with you, we sure as heck don't know who to go to help us. We just don't. I mean, it, it's a problem for females in particular. And I've talked with other, you know, females in your industry. And across the board, they're saying, you know, men talk to women like they're men. Mm-hmm. Is that yes. what you're finding? Okay, I We've thought it was heard, just me. No, it's not you, Denise. We've heard a lot of women say, I feel bullied by there you the, go. the man financial advisor. I, if I have to get mansplained one more time or, you know, speaking over my head or intimidated. And that was, it was such a compliment to get from so many women that it felt intimate and not intimidated because that's what happens a lot. And our industry has not done our job. We we use these big terms that everyday people don't use all the time or are unfamiliar with. And it, it's almost like this wall that separates us from our clients instead of, you know, let's find a way to connect with one another. Let's break down that wall. And that's why I always start an event, one, with a meditation. Denise, we start all of our events with a meditation. And then, too, I'll share a vulnerable story. I'll share a vulnerable story of something that happened to me, a client, invite somebody, and let them know, right, this is a place to get honest. And if we can't be vulnerable, we can't be honest, we're not fixing the real money issues. We're just covering the surface, and that never will lead to sustainable success and triumph with your money at all. No. And I wanted to ask you, what inspired you to go down this particular route, route, however you want to pronounce it? What what made you decide that, and you partly explained it, I think, that women are not really being served well. And I don't think it's deliberate. I hope it's not deliberate. But you're right. We don't understand a lot of the terminology. We get a little irritated like, dude, you're talk- I'm not married. Don't talk to me and tell me to go find my husband. Just don't. <laughs> I've had that happen. It's like, really? Yes. Really? No. That, you know, that phone went down real quick. Oh, <laughs> it didn't work with me. Oh, no. Yes. I always say, don't wait for Prince Charming because he declared bankruptcy and <laughs> you can do a lot better. <laughs> you know? well, and you, if we understand And if we know what questions to ask, that's really all we're asking for. And it's not just a female thing. There's a lot of males, too, that go, I didn't understand a word of that. And I think it goes back to what you said, the big words and the, you know, there's so much about finances and financial responsibility that we just don't know what to ask, male or female. We don't know. Yes, we don't know. We don't know where to start. And when that happens, it tends to just seem so overwhelming to make any steps forward. And you try to go online and research it, and then you're just going to get overstimulated with so much information out there. And that's what we want to break through. So having these different events, we have our own podcast, Women Behind the Millions. I've written several books. We're now publishing our advisors' books. Just how can we get this education, this information out there, but in a way that will engage our audience? get them thinking, even giving them different questions to ask. And This isn't a transaction. This is a relationship that we're building. And so I love working with female advisors. I love working with female clients because we are so relationship focused. We are amazing at networking and connecting women together. We love taking time to really get to know one another on a deep level and get, giving each other space. If a client comes in, and I might have an agenda of what we need to accomplish, but if she comes in and she just needs to vent, Denise, I am going to let her vent. I'm not going to go right into fix-it mode. I'm going to let her be. Let's talk this through. Let's see what kind of epiphanies come out of this conversation, and then we can move forward. 
I'm not going to force her into whatever I had on the itinerary if that's not what she needs in the moment. I think women are very good at reading that and sensing it from one another. And we're such nurturers. We, we do like to be educated before we make a financial decision. And we tend to be more conservative when we invest our money. So there are studies that have shown women are better when it comes to investments and returns because they'll take the conservative route. They take time. They want to get educated. They want to understand what what risk am I taking on? Am I okay with that risk? What does it mean if it doesn't come to fruition? What's my plan B? And things like that. So I do, I love working with women. And I know you asked earlier what brought me into being a wealth advisor, a financial advisor. I actually grew up in the industry. My father's been one for about 40 years now. And I started working in his office, even stuffing envelopes when I was probably eight, nine years old, (laughs) stuffing these cold skull mailing envelopes. And then I would work there in the summers. I started to get licensed in college, working internships, and I graduated college in 2010. I joined his firm, and it was all male advisors at the firm, and pretty quickly I felt the odd man out, the odd woman out, I should say. Like I didn't belong the jokes that the advisors were saying, the wholesalers, all these men in the industry, they they didn't feel right to me, but I did what usually happens. I just did what I was told to do. I did what was expected of me. I did what I should have done. And what happened, Denise, is I started to just blend in like everybody else. And mm. I think this happens to a lot of women. We, we, we're we trying to fit in so desperately that we lose a piece of ourselves. And there's even a picture we put on social media a lot, too. You can see it at Pink Fix My Money. And there's a picture of me in a black suit. My hair is pulled back. I have very little makeup on. Definitely no hot pink lips anywhere. There's no pink anywhere in the picture. Very subdued makeup, jewelry, everything. And then there's a picture of me now, full hot pink. <laughs> hair is curled or blown out. You know, makeup just being who I am. Got a tiara. Let's not forget yes, the tiara. tiara. It's on your book. I'm happy to get some height with that crown <laughs> on my head. But I also noticed, Denise, at the same time I was blending in, I noticed women at our meetings, they just weren't that engaged. And it's not that they didn't want to be, but it's kind of what we were talking about before. They didn't know how to. They didn't know what questions to ask. They didn't know how it was relating to them, right? Talking about this stock portfolio, right? How is that actually affecting their money today and in the future? How is it relating to them taking care of their mother? How is it relating to them getting their kids through college. So I begged my father, can I just start doing some female events? And he finally said yes. And that's where it started. I had an event. I had 25 women show up to, and it was all about women in transition. So we had women retiring, getting a divorce, losing a loved one, becoming a mom who were there. And I thought, there's a real need for this. I mean, the women, they were starving for information. They were starving for an environment like this, a community. And that's really what we're building is a community. And then I started writing my blog, Not Your Father's Advisor. That spurred my first book, Strong Women, Stronger Assets. My second book, Time to Refine. I did different programs throughout the years as well, just geared towards women. And then Confessions of a Money Queen was my last book. That was released. And then the next year, we birthed the Women's Wealth Boutique. In 2022, we opened up our doors as a registered investment advisory firm, which for people who aren't in our industry means that we are we are completely independent. There's not a firm telling us that we need to use so-and-so's funds or so-and-so's stock. It's completely independent. We are all fiduciaries. We're putting our clients' best interests ahead of ourselves. And it also opens us up to be able to use the best technology, the best planning software, partner with the best people that we want to, not who the firms are forcing us to. <clears throat> and that was a huge shift for us to be able to do that. And then last year, we onboarded five female advisors. This year, we just onboarded two female advisors in Indiana, South Carolina, and then we're onboarding two more that are coming up later this summer as well. 
So oh, within the last year, it really has, the community has grown and expanded in so many more ways than I ever thought it was going to. I opened up my doors at the Women's Wealth Boutique to help my clients, to help me, to just do better in this world for women. And it just inspired a lot of women to, you know, we're coming with you. <laughs> we want to do this with you, too. And from there, it's just taken off. And, you know, I've got questions. So I've been scribbling notes down. <laughs> I'm going to ask you about fiduciary in just a minute and ask you to explain that. But I had written down widows and divorcees. And the reason I wrote down widows and divorcees is because as a web developer, I work with a lot of different clients. And I built a site some years ago for a woman who she had really gotten the bad end of the stick in a very messy divorce, very, very messy. And there was a lot of financial shenanigans going on. And she had to fight her way out of that. And her story, honest to goodness, you know, you, you said they come in and they just need to, to rant or vent. Oh, my. I mean, my stomach hurt oftentimes when I got off the phone with her, not because of her ranting or being upset. It was just the story was so stinking awful. And she finally worked her way through it. But what she had to do, and I bet you see this a lot, she had to fire the people who were in charge of her finances because they worked with her husband and they weren't going to listen to her at all. So she just Mm -hmm. flat fired them. I didn't blame her. No, I wouldn't blame her either. I've walked into even divorce attorneys with my client and I said, you need to get a new divorce attorney. Because mm-hmm. they do not have your best interests at hand. They're missing a huge piece of the finances that should have been addressed, things like that. But it's true. Divorces can be so messy. I witness it with, you know, family members, friends. And it's why we do have a huge, we have a very strong divorce presence at the Women's Wealth Boutique. Three of us are certified divorce financial analysts because it is so important. So even if one of our other advisors has a client going through a divorce, we will collaborate to help support that client, even though they're not directly ours. They're one of our firms, and we right. want their, to serve them and have their best interest at hand. And we really do become like that divorce advocate, especially when it comes to the money. Because once the divorce settlement's done, it is very hard, <laughs> very, very hard to fix it, change it, go back there. Or if money is mismanaged, and then there's no more money yeah. left. No money you do. Wait, wait. You're going to go after them, but there's no stolen. money. It was just flat stolen. Oh. And she's one of the nicest people. She's still a very good friend. And, you know, I update her website every once in a while. And every once in a while, I'll think about her story, and I just grab my stomach. But, I mean, she came out of it strong. But, oh, my, she had to go through an awful lot. I'm sure. I'm sorry to hear that. And that's why we try to be as proactive as we can to prevent things like that happening. I'm sorry that happened to your friend. I think it happens to a lot of people, male and female. Where there's money involved, somebody's going to get it wrong. I mean, that's just all there is to it, from what I can see. But you, you mentioned that you're fiduciaries. I think I know what that means, but explain it to the audience, if you would. Ooh. This is a good question. This It's coming up. It's definitely a hot topic nowadays. You see more articles about it. It's more in the press. So a fiduciary means that you need to put your client's best interests ahead of your own, ahead of mine as an advisor. You know, whenever money is involved, as you said before, there's always a cost to do it. So even if you put money in your bank savings account, there's still a cost for the money to be there, right? The bank's going to pay you some money, but they're then mm-hmm. taking your money. And they're loaning it out and earning, especially nowadays with interest rates, five, six, seven, eight percent on your money. Mm-hmm. So there's always a cost to doing any kind of financial transaction. People don't just give you money to give you money, <laughs> unfortunately, not in our world. And as advisors, we get paid different ways. So they sell in your account, they're earning money. And I'm not saying this is right or wrong, but it's good for people to be aware, how is their advisor making money? Why are changes being made in my account? Is it to grow and protect my money, or is it because that advisor needs to pay himself for the month? And then there's the other... That makes sense, Denise? Oh, yeah. Okay, good, good. 
you're still with me. The other side is where you just charge a flat advisory fee, 1%, 2%, depending on the arrangement, the services being provided, so that no matter what happens in the account, it's just that flat fee. It doesn't mean I'm going to get paid more if I make changes or less. It doesn't mean I'm going to get paid more if I use certain investments versus others. It's just the same flat fee. And that's really where the industry is trying to push advisors to because it is removing a lot of those commission conflicts of interest as well. And that's where we always, where I always operated and now that's across the board out of the Women's Wealth Boutique because it's a flat advisory fee that we are charging. And then you have, you have us for whatever questions you want. I never wanted to be, I know attorneys do that retainer model and then they charge for hourly what I've seen happen then is well, somebody might not want to pay for that hour, so they'll research their own advice or they'll Google it or they'll ask Dr. a friend. Google. That's how and, we all know we have something horrible wrong with this. Dr. Google, don't do yes, it. Exactly. Uh, find an expert. And then they make this decision with their money, and it might not even be directly with their money, but now I'm like, oh, geez, now how do we unwind that? And unfortunately, a, a a mistake with money can be a lot of money. It can be a very costly mistake. So we always want to have open communication with our clients that whenever they needed us, and they still do, they have they have our number, they have the link to our calendar, they can jump on it right then and there, and let's talk it through, and they don't have to worry about being charged for that hour. And that's just all part of the services that we do to help prevent things. And we never know when things come up. I might get laid off the next day, and I need extra support and help, or my parent might just pass away. Or, as we talked about before, divorce. Now I, I, I feel I need to talk with my advisor weekly, monthly. I need updates. I need to hash out what we went through with my attorney or mediation, all of those different pieces of it. So me, removing the conflicts of interest of where the advisor is putting their money, your money, and really look at what are the services that I'm getting from this relationship. Because, again, if our goal, as I said before, is to build wealth together. So, yes, there is a fee to it, but that fee should put more money back in your pocket, whether it's saving on planning, taxes, growing your money, investment, different opportunities as well. And. Yeah, I think you actually asked, this is going to be my next question, Jessica, what are some of the current trends or developments in your field and how are they impacting your world, your work or your industry? And you just covered the flat fee. Is there anything else that you're seeing that, you know, think, "Mm hmm, that's good or, ooh, don't like that? Some of the new things that, and we've been seeing them for a while, one, technology, like being able to view our money has never been easier than it is right now knowing where money is so there's another piece like there shouldn't be an excuse to not knowing what's going on with your money right you can get on your phone and within seconds have an app and you can see your 401k your employee benefits IRA whatever kind of account you have so technology can be great it can also be overwhelming to people especially we are in such volatile times in the market especially after last year we've had spikes in our interest rates time and time again. That's put us in a very different investment environment than we've been in in decades, decades. And there are different opportunities when that comes up. There are times we need to protect our money, and there are times when we're going to be able to grow our money. So how to navigate this high inflation, low, no, even negative growth in our economies, in the markets, it's requiring a lot more assistance than ever before. Looking at some investment vehicles that we have haven't been popular in decades as well. <laughs> That's where it's beneficial to work with an advisor who is seeing these trends, seeing there's opportunities. No matter what market environment, there are different opportunities and take advantage of those because they're short lived. They're not going to be here forever. They're probably going to pace out within the next year or so as well. So technology, the different environments we're dealing with within the markets. And some themes and trends that we're seeing with women as well, women are getting married later in life. 
So they tend to have more assets going into the marriage. What does that mean? What assets are your assets and what assets are marital assets? And how does that change once you do become married? Same thing with debt. Your partner has debt, you have debt. How does that remain separate versus marital debt as well? And we're seeing new generations that are becoming, have you ever heard of the term, Denise, the sandwich generation? I have. And that's been around for a while. It has. So that's where, to our listeners, you have your own family. Take myself. I'm a baby. I'm a millennial. I have young kids, a five-year-old and a two-year-old. And then as my parents age, let's say they need extra help and support. Now I'm taking care of my parents and my children. And there's even some generations that are taking care of their parents, their children, and their grandchildren. Their which grandchildren. Is, right. What is that called? A club sandwich. <laughs> So that's called a disaster. <laughs> <laughs> that's called chaos and stress. <laughs> so what's interesting, Denise, because the baby boomers were the sandwich generation, but now it's changing the Gen Y, Gen X, and now the millennials, the older millennials are becoming the sandwich generation. And we're seeing how the long-term care, nursing homes, or estate planning, that's the conversations are changing is what we're seeing before. You know, the baby boomers' parents, there wasn't conversations about long-term care and nursing homes. No, they brought you home. My exactly. grandparents put a, I can't remember what it was, it was a little green trailer in the back of, they were farmers, and they just put this little green trailer back there. My great-grandfather, I think it was, I can't remember how many, generations now but I remember seeing him they put a little fence around him he had his own little place and anytime we wanted chickens we just opened his gate to you know, ushered a chicken in and we had chicken for dinner he hated chickens but that's how you <laughs> I'm remembering that now but you know oh, it's, he hated them <laughs> he's like ah okay grandma <laughs> we're having chicken noodle soup but but it was never a, there was no place for them to go. They went home with their family as far as I can remember it. Yes. Most of the time they did. They aged at home as long as they could and then they would move in. And it's not like that generation had a ton of assets. Most of them had pensions, some social security, maybe a handful of stocks, some CDs, treasury bills, things like that. Now the baby boomers, as they're coming into retirement and in retirement, they have the most assets of any generation before them. So mm-hmm. you're going to see more generational wealth transfers happening, moving like the baby boomers. They're going to pass on their estates to their children and so on and so forth. But the baby boomers saw and witnessed what happened with their parents as they aged. And we hear it all the time, even my parents say, like, I don't want you changing my diaper. I don't want you in- seeing me in that mm-hmm. room. And they're being more proactive in the planning and the funding strategies to pay because nursing homes are expensive. I know. This, and I, I doubt that this is true, but there's this meme or, or, you know, kind of a joke that goes around every now and then that where a lady said, I'm not going into a nursing home, and she just, you know, moved into a cruise ship. And had <laughs> yes. a said it was cheaper. I heard that too. Yes, you're looking at in my area ten to fifteen thousand dollars a month. What a month in a nursing oh, home a month. So it can take all of your assets very quickly. And you see these baby boomers who have worked decades for this. Wow, they've worked so hard for this money, and then to just bleed it out at a nursing home. So they're being more proactive, and they're bringing in their children to have the conversations around it. And that's what needs to happen more and more is what's the plan? What's the funding strategy? How do we pay if I want a home health aid at home first? And then maybe we're assisted living or nursing home. How are we going to pay for or it? hospice? Yeah. Doesn't hospice come into that at some point? Hospice only comes in if you are passing away. So long-term gotcha. care doesn't necessarily mean you're going to you're passing away within the immediate future. It means you can't do two of the five activities of daily living, which is like getting dressed, eating, bathing, going to the bathroom, and moving from place to place. So 
And Medicare doesn't pay for it unless it's hospice or the condition's getting better. But with long-term care, usually the condition's not getting better. It's just this very, very slow deterioration, progression of whatever illness, like dementia, Alzheimer's. You can't use your legs anymore, things like that. Stroke, right, victims and things. So you pay for it or Medicaid will pay for it. But Medicaid will only pay for it if you are broke, which they'll look at. You have to have less than $2,000 of assets to your name. Now, oh. you can, if your spouse is alive, they can keep, That's and I believe terrible. it's around 150000 the spouse can keep in qualified assets. So you're spending through all of your assets and then going on to Medicaid, which isn't ideal for a lot of people. So it, it is becoming, we have to be much more proactive. We have to look at your health, the longevity on your family. And then what kind of legacy do you want to leave your family members? Do you do you really care about your wealth being passed on or maybe going to a nonprofit or a charity as well? What kind of legacy do you want? And if you have a spouse, you really, really need to plan because you burning mm-hmm. through those assets, okay, it's not and this happened at the client. This happened after the fact. We started working with them. And now they're in their 80s, and they have barely any money to live on. So that's not a great situation either. So as you're talking about the trends that we're seeing, more of these conversations are happening, and that's very critical. What are the expectations of the parents versus the children? Who's paying for what? Where's the money coming from? And just letting the children in on their financial world and who's supporting it, the advisors, the estate or elder care attorneys, you know, accountants, CPAs, who's helping and aiding them instead of the children having to figure it all out on top of managing their own life, their own family, their own careers as well. And that is so important. And a word just popped into my head while you were talking, and that word is bankruptcy. Ooh, yes. Mm-hmm. So where and do you now go from there? your children are supporting you, let's say after you spent through your assets and your spouse passed away, but you're still here. Now, your children are financially supporting you or leaving the workforce to take care of you. And that's a huge financial hit to both households. If you have to leave the workforce, you're leaving your prime earnings time of your career. You're leaving contributing to your 401K. You're leaving contributing to Social Security. So it hits you a few different ways for your retirement. And, yes. We don't want to see our parents in that situation, and we also don't need any more stress to our own lives and our own finances. So it's it really is a, we call it a legacy of love, right? This is a thing that you're doing not just for your own sanity and peace of mind that I have the funds, the financing to be able to afford to age, but I'm not passing this burden on to my children. And that's the biggest gift parents can give to their children. Oh, absolutely. We went through that with my mom. Mm-hmm. And, and this is going to sound very odd, but, you know, we're a pet nation. We really are. I don't know how many millions, billions of dollars are spent annually on pets. <laughs> and the reason I'm asking, because I just went to the vet Saturday, but, but, I recently fostered three cats from Mississippi. My friend and her brother went over and picked them up because mama, grandmother, I think it was her her mother-in-law, had to go into dementia care. So the cats wound up over here, and I finally rehomed two of them to the brother. He didn't want them, but I made him take them anyway. And I kept the 18-year-old Calico because I was not going to move her. from. She'd been in one house all of her life. Coming here was stressful. I wasn't going to move her again. But then, I mean, we've got children. As we get older, we've got children. We've got very much loved pets. Mm -hmm. So is that something that a financial advisor helps us? Like, okay, we can help you, you know, get them into, I I don't even know if that's a real question, but they're a big deal. We all have pets. It is. And we we inherited my grandmother's dog, and he was a 50-pound Cocker Spaniel. So he mm. should have been about 20, 25 yeah, pounds. Yeah, I was going to say. He was a chunk. 
<laughs> he looked like a walking ottoman <laughs> with his hair cut. <laughs> and Denise, we, we got him and we brought him to the vet right away. And we found out he had Cushing's disease, which is why he was so overweight. He just couldn't stop eating and drinking water. Very oh. bloated. He had a skin disease. He had, and the medication he was on was costing, I want to say, $75 a week. What? It was expensive, yes. Uh, and, you know, we did the best we could with him, and he was very, very old. He passed away, I want to say one or two years of us watching him. And after that, my mom very quickly put into her will a certain amount of money because my parents will always have dogs. Since then, those two dogs passed away, but now they have their, their new dog who they are obsessed with. And it makes sense to have a certain amount of money set aside for those it does. Dads, so that the next family taking them on can afford the best care for them or to have pet and there is pet health insurance. My husband and I, we had it on our dog. We had a little wiener dog named Duke. And when Duke was two years old, he had a herniated disc that made him paralyzed in his back two legs. Mm. We rushed him to I've the hospital. I've seen that with this. This type of dogs is pretty yes. common, I think. It is very common, and they, they did surgery on him right away. They said they, And he was only eight pounds. They removed this huge mass from his disc. And the pet insurance, this was a $6,500 surgery, and the pet insurance paid 80% of it. So we didn't have to make the decision, can we financially afford this? We can make the decision, this is what's best for our family, for our dog and his well-being. So pet insurance... And look at, you can add your pets to your will to trust so was, that yeah, they can get Yeah, I was going to ask about that because, and like you, I have a, a, well, I have a uh, Facebook group called Feline Office Assistants. I work from home. I have cats and a dog. And, you know, they're my company. They help me, H-A-L-P. They help a lot. But my one, one of my gingers, Melby, seven years old, just everybody else in the house is elderly, like 17, 18 years old, I kid you not, felines, but these two are the youngest and they're seven. And Silas the Good is what I call my platinum cat. He had four UTIs in a row oh. and he was about $4,000 before we got it all mm-hmm. sorted out. We got it sorted out by what I call the wackaweeny surgery. They basically just took everything out, turned him into a girl, but he hasn't had UTIs since. Wow. Four yeah. grand. I mean, fortunately, I was able to pay it, but oh, it hurt my feelings. It hurt my bank account. It hurt everything. Yes. Yes. I've seen where clients, they get laid off and they immediately buy the pet insurance because, again, they they don't want to have to make a decision because of the money. They want to make a decision what's going to be best for their their animal, just like we would for our children, their animal. Exactly. And their family. As well. well, I'm so glad that you're giving advice on how people can help with that, because I mean, my friend, my friend Maggie and I just did our wills recently. She has cats, I have cats, and we have been trying to figure out how we're going to get care for them, especially after you know these fosters came from Mississippi. We're like, we better get that fixed. <laughs> Neither one of mm-hmm. us had a plan. So we do now, but you know something has to happen before you go. Oh, let me fix that. Yes, you can even have, depending on your house, the life insurance on yourself, and the proceeds can go to, and I'm not a lawyer, but you could have it set up so that the beneficiaries, not that you can't name your cats as the beneficiaries, but some sort of trust, I'm sure, could have a go to them, or even a charity or nonprofit that mm-hmm. that will help like take care of them. Like a shelter or something, right? Exactly. Exactly, which is a really nice legacy to have because yes so many people have pets and they sadly don't live as long as us but they do bring so much comfort and a sense of home to people they really are amazing therapy (laughs) they really are and you know if and that's another thing we're talking about you know the sandwich generation I'm guessing that you know these people have a lot of things we all have things. We all have stuff. I look around my house. My house is not messy. My attic worries me. I'm afraid it's going to cave in on me one day. There's so much stuff up there. 
And we can look around and say, okay, is this clutter? Or, you know, if it's hidden, it's still clutter. It's just hidden. But that used to be cash. Now, all of that stuff has to be gotten rid of or moved or given away. Something has to be done with the pets. You have to sort out the finances. There's, there's an awful lot that happens when generational, ch- generational changes start taking place. And that's when they need to come to somebody like you would be my thought. Yes, and there's so many logistics of it, and I talk about this a lot. I work with, you know, women who are coming into retirement or in retirement, and you think about it, you go to a nursing home, what happens to your stuff, right? Who's taking care of your house? Yeah, yeah you've got who's one moving, room. Yeah, who's moving your things, and who's making sure your those family heirlooms, your memories, the things that you want yeah. to keep and move on aren't lost in the shuffle, Either or stolen, yeah, that happens. So many things happen. I just had a call with clients, and he's close to retirement. She's been retired, and they go, "We, Jessica, we just cleared out our entire attic." <laughs> they were, they were so <laughs> excited, and he's, they've been in the house for twenty plus years, which happens a lot. You know, you found your spot, you're there twenty, thirty years. They go, "We cleared it out," and part of the plan, they they aren't sure if they're going to move or not, but clearing it out free them up to the option of it, that that won't be an excuse anymore. I can't move. I have too much stuff to go through. And I have clients there month by month. They're picking a room. They're picking a project. And they're getting it sorted through. And there are a lot of organizations that can help you because there's things that you can donate. There's things you cannot donate, like mattresses that need to go. And then who's going to pick those things, items up? Where do they go? Electronics that no longer work. You can't just throw them out. Where do those go? And then your heirlooms as well. And what can you sell? And usually, if you have a good amount of things that can sell, that's going to cover the cost of having this professional do a lot of the heavy lifting for you. And that is well worth it as well. So look in your area, because they are going to be area-specific, and start the project. Create a list, everything that you want to organize or get rid of. Create the list. Chunk it down. Month, weeks, year, how you want to get this done. But what's amazing, Denise, is as we start to declutter our lives, and it could be your emails that you clear out. It could be your phone contacts. It could be your closet. That actually does open you up to receiving more. It you just does. Clear it out. It creates it space really for opportunity. Does. For money. I've been doing the same thing. I've been oh, cleaning yeah. everything out. I've been cleaning out my garage. My garage, honest to God, it looks like a tornado ripped through. It said, oh, I'm not done. Came back and finished the job. I've been cleaning that out like crazy. I don't even know how it got there. I don't even know how it got this bad. Yes, that's exactly what happens. Like, I don't think I keep a lot of stuff. And then if there's space, we tend to fill it. Mm-hmm. There's space but you're right. Once you start opening that, Look, I I picked a room. I took your advice before you even gave me your advice. <laughs> and I cleaned out my foyer, which was not messy. But, you know, I noticed a couple cobwebs and it, it just, it was driving me crazy. It's the, the door I come in and out to get out of the house. And I moved the bench. I moved, you know, I moved everything out and I cleaned it. And every time, <laughs> I sound like an idiot here, but every time I would come out of my office and I would go towards the living room, it's all open concept, <clears throat> excuse me. I would automatically take a right and look at my, my foyer and go, oh, it's so clean. I was so happy. And you know what? I kept it that way. And what an energy shift from yes. trying to avoid it, <laughs> from being depressed every time you walk in and out of your house to it or energizes irritated. you. Irritated. It gives you a sense of peace or calm or excitement to want to do more of that in your house. I'm sure there's something with uh, feng shui, too, to have a clean entrance. I'm sure it opens you up to wealth. <laughs> there you go. But I have noticed that if I clear space, and in my house, if you walked in, you would never think that I'm worried about all the hidden stuff because it's hidden. We all have the junk door, drawer. We have the closets. We have under the bed. It's all stuff that used to be cash. Get rid of it. If you haven't seen it in two years, you don't need it anymore. Yes. Yes. I remember reading something at the – Costs more, less than twenty five dollars, and it will take you twenty five minutes or more to find it. 
get rid of it. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> because it clearly and here's, isn't something you use day to day. <laughs> right. It can, be, it can be replaced very easily, and it won't break your bank to replace it. <laughs> and renting storage is expensive. You basically just made everything in there worth zero. It, it's just, don't do it. Okay, I wanted to talk to you about your book. I've got it on my desk, and it's the third one. I think you said Confessions of a Money Queen, and I, like I said, I, admit, I love your tiara. But this book is 10 Money Moves to Claim Your Power and Your Prosperity. Tell us about the book. This book, so my first two books took me a few months to write. I would kind of mirror them after a program that I saw amazing success with at my clients. And the win them in them. And then this book, I had an idea what the book was going to be about. I met with my business coach and we got very clear on what it was about. It was kind of it wasn't confessions yet, it was like commandments, kind of like pillars that you live and die by. And once I got clear on it, Denise, I wrote the book in one week. In one week. Really? And I said to my husband that Friday, <laughs> I have eight chapters written to my new book. This was at dinner, and he got very nervous, and he said, there's going to be no children with this book, because my first two books, I was pregnant with them while <laughs> writing and launching the book. Oh. No, there's no baby. Trust me, it's just a book. So, just have the two kids. And what I look, to me, this book, I love it so much because it, one, it was a download from God. Right? He, he came through very powerfully, and it shows a very different side to money. It shows an abundant side, the spiritual side of money, which it's so different in the financial industry. With the financial industry, there's so much fear around money. There's so much restriction around money. And I feel the regulators put the fear onto the broker-dealers, the broker-dealers put onto the advisors, and then we're projecting onto our clients. You know, you have to do this or you're going to run out of money. You have to do this. And I kept seeing through, you know, I've been an advisor for almost 15 years now. We get people out of debt, they go back into debt. Or they'd be terrified of money, they'd save two, three million dollars, and they'd be even more terrified with their money. Like, clearly what we're doing, it, it's helping to a degree, but it's not fixing the real root of people's money fears, their issues, these patterns that we find ourselves in money. So that's what Confessions of a Money Queen is. It's a step-by-step, step-by-step instruction manual to reprogram your mind, your emotions around money, to heal any of the money trauma that you had even from growing up. If you saw your parents fighting about money, well, that inflicted a certain perception of money, that money causes resentment, anger, fighting. So you're going to act and operate a certain way with money. So how can we heal the old money patterns and traumas with money? Open yourself up to receiving the wealth, reprogramming our mind, our beliefs, our emotions. And then the practical side, when the money comes in, what do we do with the money? Where are we funneling it? How is it going to help us achieve our goals? What's the right accounts, vehicles, everything to get the money working for us? And that builds the trust. Because money is a relationship between us and the money. And most of the time when people don't have the wealth that they desire, it's because there's a lack of trust. That having more money doesn't feel safe to them or it's scary. Or if I receive this wealth, will it last? Am I going to blow it? You see so many lottery winners. They win all this money and then they're bankrupt. You see it with celebrities, athletes who have this huge windfall of money and then they're broke. They're missing the trust. They're missing the practical side of, now, how do I best optimize this money? How do I create my own cash cow, my own cash account that keeps pumping money into my world? And so it covers from the spiritual side all the way to the practical side, and it leads you step by step so it's not overwhelming. It's very piecemeal, right? Piece by piece, I'm going to get this done. I'm going to keep building on what I learned before and leveling up with my money. The first of the book, and I love that you're you're explaining why you wrote the book and what it's all about. And the very first thing I read was the earning law stated is that 
All wealth is created by the human mind. Increasing your wealth is a matter of increasing the quality of your thoughts. Phil Lott, author of Money is My Friend. I cannot disagree with that. You know, if you think you don't have money, you don't have money. If you, look, I'll be honest with you, Allison, I'm very deeply spiritual. I'm not religious at all. Never have been, never will be. But I have my guides. I get God winks all the time. I have a lot of beliefs that are not religious. Nothing against religion is just not for me. But I spend, you can think I'm a lunatic here, but I spend a good bit of time during the day sitting on my couch with a cat, you know, either stuck around, you know, behind the couch, you know, on my neck or on my lap, looking up at my ceiling fan. And I talk out loud to my ceiling fan because I'm pretty sure the way the cats behave, there's either spiders up there or there are angels up there. I'm not sure. Probably both. <laughs> <Probably both. the laughs> <laughs> That's my thought, too. And I will state my intentions and my expectations out loud to my ceiling fan. And guess what? It works. Wow. Look at that. That's amazing. I do something. It's not a ceiling fan, but when I walk into my office every morning, I sit down on my couch at 8 a.m. after I drop my kids off at school, and I call it my daily money practice. I sit there. I meditate. I journal, I pray, I talk to God, wherever I feel moved to do. And that's where I get all my inspiration. It's where I figure out any issues that have been happening. And I've I've learned once to train my thoughts and be very disciplined at filtering through what are my productive thoughts, what are my destructive thoughts. Mm-hmm. And I've also have learned how to get very curious when I have a negative thought. Or like an imposter syndrome thought. And get very curious, where is this coming from? Is this me or is this somebody else projecting onto me? Is this from something my mom said to me when I was a little girl? Is there any truth to this? And instead of acting on that negative thought, I'm just now curious. Why is it there? Feeling through it. And then you can release it. It's almost becoming detached from them as well. But I'm with you, Denise. I think having those moments where you can sit in silence and see what needs to come out of you, what do you need to receive back? And you're right. I grew up Catholic. I went to nine years of Catholic school. I've always gone to Catholic church. But I did have to find my own relationship with God or you call it your higher power, source, the divine, the universe. There's all these different terms. And that's why I encourage everybody, you don't have to fit into this cookie-cutter mold of what religion or spirituality has to look like. Explore what you want it to look like. What kind of relationship do you need or would like to create? And start there. It doesn't have to be, I need to pray X amount of minutes every day. I need to read so many oh. chapters in the Bible. I need to go to church once or twice a week. It can be however you want to shape it up to be. Same thing with your money. But I invite you all to to just have that started. Start thinking about it. Get curious about what that relationship could look like because when you do, it is a game changer. It is. Yeah. uh, I can't say enough about it. But that's and part of Confessions of a Money Queen. It talks about that, right? It could be God. It could be universe, divine, whoever you, you think in those amazing moments, who you pray to in the tough times. There's somebody there that you've been talking to all along who is oh, yeah. how can we open that door up a little bit more and a little bit more and you're gonna see that all of a sudden your whole day you're thinking about God or you're thinking about the universe, or you're thinking about energies and things like that. And then to bring it into your money. Bring that conversation in about money. Do you feel guilty about money? If you do, why? Why do we have this guilt around money? God wants all of us to be wealthy. He wants all of us. He doesn't want all of us. He doesn't want any of us to be scrimping by, barely making ends meet, bankrupt and pay in debt. He wants us all to prosper. So if it's not from him, where's that negative programming coming from? Oh, it's our mindset. Did mm-hmm. are you familiar with Byron Katie? I'm not. That's right. Oh, you'll have, that. Yeah, you'll have to go listen to Byron Katie. It's um, B Y R A N Katie. She, I listened to her some time back, and she always asked the question, is it true? Is it really mm-hmm. true? And that has stuck in my head all these years. When you have those 
you know, sometimes silly or sometimes just downright dangerous thoughts that pop into your head. And I'm so glad that you said, you know, listen, we're a big megaphone. We have this huge consciousness that there are no new ideas. We're all working on the, with the same information. Sometimes we hear things from other people that pop into our heads. Sometimes they're God winks. Sometimes people just get nasty. We might hear that too or feel it. We really do if we're paying attention. But I will stop, you know, much as you didn't say, is that true? Is that really true? Well, go away now. And I get kind of cranky. Sure. Yes. It's good. Yes. Go away. We we filter through them. Okay, that's enough. Yeah, Yeah, you're wrong. (laughs) Really, it's just wrong. Yes. Even in Confessions of a Money Queen, I have money meditations throughout it, and then there's a a course that goes right along with the book, the 10 steps, and we have a meditation on releasing the cord because there, no matter what, we do have these very heavily influenced people in our lives. Maybe it was your dad, your mom, your, your ex-spouse, your partner, boss, and when you feel that energy leave your body and you're, okay, we're parting, I send them love it's fine we're separate but I'm no longer let them dictate what happens with me my life my money relationships going forward and that can be a very healing process to people and even identifying sometimes it's so in our subconscious we don't even know who these people are that are still dictating what happens with us and our money which is crazy but so many of our habits they just live in our subconscious they do. And I'll, I'll, I'll give you one more little secret. When I, I don't sleep a whole lot. Young people say, oh, I sleep like a baby. Yeah, so do I, because babies wake up every two hours. Now, if you tell me you sleep like a teenager, I'll know that you sleep like a rock. But sleeping like a baby, that's, I catnap. I never have slept all night in my entire life. It doesn't bother me. It's always been that way. But when I know that I'm about to fall asleep, finally, it may be 11 o'clock at night, it may be 1 or 2 in the morning, I will turn over out loud. I do a lot of talking out loud because if you have, if you're thinking something, it's like a highway in there. You've got 40 different things crossing that thought or adding to it. But if you're speaking it out loud, you can only say one thing at a time as a rule. And I will say, okay, to, you know, whoever I'm talking to, it could be God, it could be spirit. I don't know who it is, my subconscious. And I'm talking to my subconscious and I will ask for a, a review of something that I did that I wasn't or was trying to work on that wasn't real comfortable. I don't feel like I did it right. Or it's a question about a piece of code. It could be anything. 318 in the morning, that answer pops up without fail. I keep a a dream journal next to my table, next to my bed, because the answer is going to, you know, it's going to show up and it's going to be perfect. So trust your subconscious. I love that. That's fantastic. I've always done it. Listen, we've only got a couple of minutes. This has been fascinating. I think we got a little bit off track, but not necessarily. Because everything we do, I believe, has a spiritual component, whatever you want to call it. We're not here by ourselves, just kind of thrust out there to sink or swim. We're just not. You know, I it's... agree. I always feel that's the biggest where I'm supposed to be going. And Say it like again. You broke up. Here. Oh, I'm sorry. I always feel that God takes us wherever we're supposed to go with these conversations and that somebody's listening that needed to hear a certain message today. We just got to trust them. Yeah. Yeah. We're all of it. it. (laughs) Well, listen, it has, has, and I'll probably need to get, when your next book is out, no babies, call me. I'll get you back on the phone. Oh, I love that. Thank you. I love that. Good, good, good. You have one in the works? I'm going to be writing a children's book with my daughter on money. Oh. And I think that's going to be a summer project. But Doreen Denise, we have our director of opera, sorry, our creative director is publishing. We're publishing her book later this year. And then we're going to be publishing our advisor's book. So we will be in touch with you. Do not worry. <laughs> Definitely. I really want you to come back. So listen, before I let you go, where can people find you? Where can they find the book? Ooh, so you can follow us at Pink Fix My Money. Yes, Pink Fix is everything in my world. So at Pink Fix My Money on Instagram and Facebook. And then you can go to jessicaweaver.com where you'll get all the books. And if you go today, you can grab 
the free audiobook of Confessions of a Money Queen with all the money meditations, journal prompts, all those good things in there as well. So jessicaweaver.com as well. We'll give you so much love and support for you as well. Thank you. Well, listen, everybody, as we come to the end of today's episode, please head on over to iTunes and rate us over there. Your feedback really helps me grow and inspire more people, us, grow and inspire more people on their success journeys. So be sure to hit that subscribe button, leave a review, and share your partner in Success Radio with your friends and colleagues. And go find Jessica. Listen, I have this book. I, we couldn't even cover all of it. It's an easy read. I love the cover. It's an easy read, but it is full of information that all of us need at so many levels. So grab the book. Head on to Amazon or wherever you buy your books. So everybody, thank you for tuning in, and we look forward to catching you on the next one. Jessica, thank you again. It's been lovely. Oh, thank you so much, Denise, for having me. This has been a blast spending some time with you today. Get your voice heard. If you would like to launch your own far-reaching podcast, contact Denise Griffiths at yourofficeontheweb.com and go to the podcast tab. 